My guest today is Hugo Kruger. So today I'm going to speak about, I'm going to call this the nuclear narrative to just tell people what's going on in the nuclear industry. So um, this power station here is uh, Kuburg Power Station, South Africa, but um, the US has got a lot of these things. And so is France. There's a lot of nuclear power stations. Last time I checked, it was 10% of the world's electricity. So um, what I want to challenge today is what we call dogma. Okay, now dogma, um, you know, is a religious term usually, but it's defined as assertions that may not be challenged. You're not allowed to question nuclear. It's too expensive. It doesn't work. You know, you've all those things. Now, if you look at the definition of the dictionary, it's, it's a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. Now, incontrovertibly is an interesting meaning. It says you're not able to be denied or disputed. So I got this from the Catholic World Report, this website, and uh, it's the only religious thing I'll say today, but I tried to figure out what is incontrovertible, and they say uh, that is a rational necessity and a scientific inevitability, indisputable, incontrovertible, irrefutable, and that is a catalytic fact for our modern naturalistic theory of knowledge and for many of our secular and scientific assumptions. Now, I have no idea what that sentence means, okay? But you're not allowed to deny or dispute that. You're just allowed to accept it, okay? So notable uh, examples of incontrovertible truths is uh, slogans like follow the science, all experts agree, peer crimu consensus, the government says so, do you deny the evidence, Tom? You're a heretic. You know, heretics, are, we all call them conspiracy theorists, science deniers, you know, things of those sorts, far right. Um, you know, even though I'm married to a Muslim, I'm a far right Nazi for just mentioning this type of thing. So, you know, these are the type of things we're not allowed to discuss today. So uh, I'm going to say this is my background. I have a, um, a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, and I have a master's in nuclear civil engineering, actually, from ESTP Paris. So I am giving myself the right to speak on behalf of the science, given my qualifications today. Because, you know, in climate, they said I'm not allowed to speak, but yeah, I'm qualified, actually. Now, I would encourage your listeners to judge me of the fact, uh, facts, but the, if they want to believe me for my science, they can do so. And then there's a quote here from Mark Twain that says, don't let schooling intervene with your uh, education. Okay, so and I think that's a very uh, uh, um, uh, important say, uh, slogan for what you've been covering in your podcast and what I've been covering, but uh, you're not allowed to deny what I'm saying to you today. Anyways, let's start again with this. I always start my presentations with SI units. I, I, I struggle with US units, to be honest. Um, just a quick term again. What is energy? Energy is joules. It's got the same unit as Newton times meters of torque, actually. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a force times displacement, basically. Then power is the rate of energy. It's joule per second, energy per second. And then we look at electricity generation. It's a watt times second is joule again. And please, the media always conf confuses this. When we talk about the power station's capacity, it's usually in power, and we talk about the amount of electricity generated, we're talking actually at units of joules. Um, you know, what watt hours or kilowatt hours, things of those sorts. So they, they're two different things. And you can easily confuse them if you haven't trained your mind for them. So this is a, a quick introduction on economics, actually. And it's uh, energy and economics, and it's called the low entropy theory of wealth. Now, um, I regard the, uh, um, the person I'm going to cite is Attorney Wrigley, it's Anthony Wrigley. He died in 2022, and it's a, it's a shame he could never come onto your podcast. I regard him as one of the greatest economists of the last century. He's on, he's on par with Milton Friedman, F.A. Hayek, and John Maynard Keynes, all the great names in economics. And he wrote this interesting article called Opening Pandora's Box, a new look at the Industrial Revolution. So he looks at what happened actually during the Industrial Revolution. And he came to conclude that the Western elites have a problem. We look through the Industrial Revolution through the lens of three economists, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Thomas Malthus. And they thought in terms of land, uh, um, of the relationships between uh, production, land, uh, between land, labor, and capital, those three factors. They, basically, in economic theory, you're still here today. People say, but labor does this, capital does this, land does this. Property rights are very important. So theoretically speaking, um, you know, land and uh, labor, uh, um, oh, sorry, labor and capital are indefinite, assuming a population grows forever. Um, but land is finite. Because land is finite, it's restricted. We need property rights, right? And we trade property. And this is the basis of the U.S. Constitution. You know, property is important. You need a sheriff before you come into my house type of thing. But Tony really look at this story, and he said, well, we're missing something with the Industrial Revolution. And he should actually go and ask Karl Marx for the answer, Industrial Capital. Where Karl Marx said that, the, uh, he wrote somewhere in Industrial Capital, I don't know if the quote here now, 
we said energy was the prime mover. So you realize something around the 19th century where energy happened. And that was the invention of the steam engine due to James Watt. And Wrigley here came to the conclusion, if you look at Italy and England and even Netherlands in his book, that um, all these countries were relatively free societies at the time. They had market economies, some were a bit more autocratic than others, but generally speaking, they were the same. They had rule of law, things of this sort. But England just took off in the stratosphere, and the Netherlands didn't. Even though the Dutch was the first, one of the first colonial empires, the Netherlands just exceeded everyone. The England just exceeded everyone. And he came to conclude, listen, this was due to coal. Because they had coal, there was the capacity for work, all this energy released, they could dispatch that into the economy. And that's why they had the railways, the guns, and that's why Britain ruled the oceans and was the first empire into which the sun never set. Okay, well, they're they, the industri first industrious empire into which the sun never set. So he came to conclude that we need to add energy to the equation. So not discarding land and capital and all those things, but energy is an important factor. And I must say, this is the conclusion that the Japanese made of the Industrial Revolution. And because of that, if you look at all the Asian economies, they're very skeptical of this green transition story because they all think of energy and all their leaders tend to have technical degrees. They tend to be run by engineers and we tend to be run by lawyers and accountants and economists, right? And that tends to be that tends to be, to be a problem. That you can look at your Congress when uh, John Kerry was asked the other day, what percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere? And he didn't even know a number. And that's a clear indication that he does not have a technical background. Otherwise, he would never even have chased his dream. All right. So I'm going to make sort of a case for nuclear. And I start always by looking at the energy density. Now, if you look at the amount of uh, energy in kilograms uh, of joules per kilogram, you find that nuclear just has a business case that is so much uh, more than the rest, right? It just explodes in value for, for gram. I mean, look at the ratios. It's ridiculously high. And it's the same with land usage. You have one nuclear power station sort of replaces all these solar and wind farms. Now, the wind guys would say, yes, but you can build houses under them. You can live under the wind farms. And therefore, technically, they're the same as nuclear. It's for you to decide if that's true. I think it's complete nonsense. But there's a bit of a conundrum in nuclear. And that is that the engineering case for energy density is there. You know, it's power, uh, power, it's energy, it's land, it's all those things, things. But does that necessarily mean that there's a business case? Does it cost money? Are the economists correct to say it's still too expensive? And you have to ask why that is. What are they saying? And are they right or not? So I'm going to look at, the, at the, a few case studies. This is Voxel Power Station in America. The price track's 30 billion. It might even be higher than these numbers. It's just what I got off the internet, Okay. And there were cost overruns, and you know, it's no no engineer can defend this, no economist can defend this. And anyway, the power capacity is two thousand three hundred and two. I believe it's going to be higher. There were plans for more, but that's what it's at the moment. And you get about thirteen thousand dollars per kilowatt of electricity. You know, that's quite expensive. Okay, let's be honest, that thing is not going to fly. Then I look at Hinkley Point C. The French built this in France, and if I look at the ratio, it's about ten thousand. So a little bit cheaper, but it's still. Quite high. I must emphasize these are net present values. Okay, so this is if theoretically I were to buy tomorrow, what is my lump sum? And then obviously the 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 um, the, the, the the rates that it's paid, the interest rate depends will, will play a role in this thing. How much I pay it back, what my rate is, all these things. Play. So this is just if I buy it off the shelf, assuming it's like a car tomorrow. And there are other ways of looking at prices like levelized cost and full cost of electricity. All these things. Not going to them today. Then um, size will see. This is the next one. So they built Hinkley Point and then size will see. Now they put a range here because it hasn't been built yet between 20 billion pounds and 35 billion. And when I do a quick calculation on the day's rate on dollars, it's between seven to 13,000. Now, if you think of it, France built the 10 one, first one at 10,000, the second one's at 13,000. Well, this doesn't look like a very good business case. And maybe if they get to 8,000, you can say, okay, you're hitting some kind of escalate. Is it coming down? Is it too expensive? This is what was called European pressure water reactor. Double containment building, very expensive design. Okay? So maybe just the design is too expensive. Now, interesting enough, France made a decision recently to, to not go ahead with EPR in France. They're building EPR2 and they're simplifying the design. So if you say the EPR1 has got two double containment, double concrete buildings, because it has to take an airplane, which is just absurd. It assumes that 9-11 is going to happen and things. And it's against post Fukushima and it's, it's designed for earthquakes and it's over the top. It's just a ridiculous system. And now they're simplifying it to a simpler container building. Makes more sense to me, right? So the price would probably come down. So double containment might be absurd. Maybe there's just too much safety features in nuclear. Okay, now you're not allowed to say you want to relax safety, but I'm saying, yes, we need to relax safety. Otherwise, we're going to hit these ridiculous costs. Okay, France built another EPR in Ukraito in, in, in Finland, and the price here seems to be 7,500. It was only one unit. The others were multiple units. This is a little bit less, but it's still it's, it's still not even competitive with wind and solar, you know, to be honest. So um, then this is an interesting one. We look at what the UAE is doing. 
the Barash nuclear power plant. The South Koreans are building it. They're coming in $4,000. I mean, this looks attractive to me. It's almost a third of what the U.S. is building. So why is the UAE building at a third of the United States? I mean, the U.S. is supposed to be good engineers, and you were the guys who gave the world the atom. But here, Dubai is beating you. And it's South Korea building it in Dubai. It's another country. What's happening? Okay. Yes, Pakistan. They recently signed a deal with China. They're coming in at 2,000 kilowatt, one-fifth of what the U.S. is doing. Okay, so clearly there is not a problem with nuclear being expensive. There's a problem with nuclear being expensive in the United States and maybe even in France. France is a little bit less than the U.S., but they can also do a little bit better. You know, let's face it. Why are the Chinese and the, and the South Koreans beating you? Now, people will tell me that the Chinese are hiding the money. They're putting it in a military account. They're putting it somewhere else. Maybe so, but this is what Pakistan is paying. Pakistan's getting a good deal, even if the Chinese are cheating on their books. You cannot really tell me that the South Koreans are lying because it's a free and open society. And South Korea locked up the last president for trying to steal money in nuclear. So I make the case, I don't think that's the case. Okay, I don't think China's absorbing it. So look, let's look at the costs. This is a think tank that came with costs. Now, I, I just want to emphasize these costs might range a little bit, plus minus 20, because I, I try. I, they, they, it depends on the dollar exchange rate sometimes. Um, but let's look at this. The United States is building at $12,000 a kilowatt hour. The France is coming at 10. They're saying size will the third unit, you know, the 8,000, although it might be that's the lower estimate is coming less. But let's look at the UAE. They want third of what the United States is doing. Japan is, is historically built at this unit. Russia is beating the US. Korea is beating you. China is really beating you. You're taking your money. You're lunch over here. So what is happening? Why is it that the Western countries can't get a project done on time? And yet, when we go to the East, it seems to be nuclear has got a good business case. Okay, That is what we need to question here. Why are we more expensive than the rest of the world? So let's look at how investors would judge a nuclear power plant. This is now if I put in my finance hat and the bean counters. They generally use what is called the Sharpe's ratio. Um, Sharpe's ratio tells you that uh, it's the first sum that a new investor would do. If I put your product to an investor, it would tell you, to do my sharp ratio, I'm going to work out, is this a risky or non-risky investment? Okay. Uh, and it's a high risk, high return type of calculation. And the sharp ratio tells the investor that for a project where they can only get money back after five to seven years and break even after 15 years, it depends on the interest rate, the risk of investing elsewhere in the market is seven times lower. It's seven times lower just to put my money in the bank than invest into a nuclear plant in the United States. It's not a very good investment for nuclear in the US at the moment for a private investor. However, for government, it makes sense for long-term infrastructure on the assumption that we know how to get the costs down, right? So large risk during construction, how do you manage that risk? How do you make sure that the cost comes down? I'm going to lend you money, Tom, and you're going to blow it in five to seven years and I don't get my money back. That doesn't sound like a good deal to me, right? Um, now, we need to look at historically what happened. Major nuclear plants expanded in the United States before the 73 oil crisis. It was not Three Mile Island and Chernobyl that blew nuclear. It was actually the 73 oil crisis. That is when deregulation started in the US. That is when you started moving from utilities to private companies. That was basically the beginning of the end of the New Deal. Most of them were planned for the New Deal. France was the exception. After 73, because France was so heavily dependent on oil, they went the other way. They started building nuclear. Right, But it was government-driven investment. That is important. In the US, it was also. And since the 73 oil crisis, I don't think the US nuclear has really recovered. I think that was sort of a nail in the coffin. And since then, there's been plants operating, and maybe you build one here and there, but the projects were really, they never got where they were. And I'll show you later why that is. So let's look at plant performance. This is South Africa. We built our plant around the 90s. I think we started in the 70s, but it was done in the 80s. And if you currently look at the balance sheet of our utility, ESCOM, now we still have a nationalized utility in South Africa, like you had during the New Deal. You know, you had these big utilities all over the country. And the point about utilities is, historically speaking, they didn't make a profit. They only recovered their costs. The planning electricity covered the recovered cost for the project. Plan, recover. So there was no shareholders. There was only a board of engineers and auditors, maybe. We have, in recent time, moved the privatization record as well in South Africa. And it's a big debate which resurrection we should go at the moment. But when it still worked like all utilities, you find that nuclear was actually quite affordable. So this is the balance sheet of South Africa. And until today, nuclear is the most affordable electricity in South Africa. It costs, this is in rands, which is our currency. It's 60, um, I think it's 60 cents. I think it's actually 40. The price might be higher. But anyways, it's very cheap. And the top one is renewable projects. No independent power provider in South Africa can compete with nuclear at the current rate. One reason being we've paid off the cost. The second one is we got the French to build for it. 
And if there were cost overruns, I don't think at the time there was. It wasn't our problem as South Africans. It was the French's problem because they built it for us. So you might make, make, make the distinction here between a country buying it and a country building it. The country that buys a nuclear power plant, let's say the United States is going to build for South Africa tomorrow, we agree on a price. And if there's overruns, it's from your pension money, not our money, because that's the contract. Okay, that's how it will work. That's what we call a vendor financing system. And that is how you put pressure on the guy to finish it. So what is the problem in America? Private guy lends money or government lends money, the money gets blown. There's no incentive for the builder. The builder should bring his financing. And that's how you get costs down. That's the first principle I want to illustrate here. And you see this between country to country relationships that those projects tend to be very well managed. But within countries, if you build it yourself, that's when you have overruns. It's like buying a car. If you're going to buy a car tomorrow, you go to Toyota, you go to BMW, you go to Ford, and you say, how much is a car? And let's assume there's a part that breaks in three years from now. It's their problem, not yours, under the service plan. That's how you need to structure nuclear, because they got the loan to build that project, that they carry the risk. Okay. So the concept of vendor financing, this is a good book by John Niersheimer, okay, in international law, Why Leaders Lie. And he looked at lying in international politics. He realized when are states lying or not? And he realized that democratic leaders tend to lie more to their populations than autocratic leaders. Okay, You wouldn't be surprised that your president is lying to you, right? Um, but when countries deal with countries and there's major risks, there's very little lying going on. When Ronald Reagan and, and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, committed to the end of the Cold War, they were both honest, actually. When George Bush Sr. and um, I think it was still Gorbachev or Yeltsin at the time said, um, we're going to get rid of our nuclear weapons, these were serious stakes, right? There's a life and death type of thing. They actually both committed to it, and they actually went for non-proliferation. They actually reduced your nuclear stockpile. So when countries deal with countries, you have less lying going on. And this is the concept of vendor financing. The risk must be split between both parties. Both sides must have a stake in the game. And my view is in the United States and in France, France is a little bit better, but the US, the way you structure your contracts is why you've got cost overruns. There should be more people going to jail. The base manager is the KGB. Okay, if Rosatom is late on a project, the CEO has to explain to Putin and the KGB where's the money. Okay, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be explaining to Xi, Jinping, to Xi Jinping in China why this project overruns. So you get things done on time. Okay, and that's what you need. You need a little bit of autocracy in your system. So we say even dictators like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are honest when they gamble with the children of their, with the future of their children because it's government pension money, and that's how you get large scale projects to be done on time. So. Let's look at low-cost uh, uh, low countries, developing countries. This is where I'm from, South Africa, South Korea. South Korea is the exception here, but UAE, Turkey, China, India, Russia, those countries all have youth unemployment at the moment. We lack electricity, and we need to build nuclear power. We need to build to get base loads, dispatchable energy on the system, ASAP, so we can provide food and water for our people. We don't have time to play at the moment. South Africa has two thirds of all men out of work at the moment. It's an enormously high unemployment rate. We are still debating nuclear. I don't know why. I would just go ahead with it. Egypt has locked up all the NGOs and the protesters. Sisi put them all in jail, the dictator, and he said, we're going to build nuclear power. Okay, end of discussion. See, we don't have time for protests because we need food and water because Egypt's a water dry country. Sorry, guys. Uh, and don't try and protest in China. They're going ahead with it. So all the autocratic countries are definitely going nuclear. They're not taking nonsense from the NGOs. All right. Let's look at our energy usage per person. And this will explain why this is what I just said. The United States has got enormously high energy per person. That's also why you're the richest country in the world. China's energy usage has only recently really um, accelerated, exceeded South Africa's. We were very similar for, for almost a decade ago. Okay. Um, if you look at South Africa, Turkey, Iran, India, very low energy usage. We need energy. Okay. This is why we need base load quick as possible. These tend to also be countries of nationalized utilities. They still run the electricity system like during the New Deal. There are developing countries with low electricity prices. Why do we need low prices? It needs to be as low as possible to attract factories. So government goes into a debt expansion, they get electricity on the grid. So there's jobs, the factories will come to have jobs for people. Otherwise, we have revolution because we have all these men that are out of work at the moment. And I say they need base load capacities. And utilities tend to recover costs. They don't make profit. So it's just electricity for desalination, for water. That seems to be, in my books, when I look at where nuclear is being built at the moment, where nuclear is built. And that may, might mean that the United States' uh, market and regulations might be unattractive for nuclear as an investment case. And you guys will need to think about, do you restructure your incentive and your regulatory reform? 
to accommodate nuclear, because I think your, your, your incentives is destroying the technology at the moment. Um, these are other countries building stuff. So they also, I wrote this article called Financing Option for Nuclear Plants. And Bangladesh, Pakistan, Hungary, Turkey, they're all coming with a vendor finance system. And generally speaking, the vendor, the guy who builds it, puts 85% down, uh, takes 85% of the cost. He brings the financing. 15% is the host country. And this the ratio changes a little bit between countries. And that's a very good system. So Russia takes the loan from their own national bank. They come and build it. We put 15% down to get our systems compliant. And at the end of the day, uh, when that plant is done, we'll start paying back a tariff, and that will pay back for the loan. Okay. And when the loan is paid back, we have the most affordable electricity. And if there's an issue, it's Rosatom. It's Xi Jinping, it's Westinghouse. It's not my problem, okay? That's how we structure the contract. So contract management is enormously important to cut out middlemen. And I think what happened in Vogtel is your contracts were structured like idiots, okay? They need to, the, the, the US really needs to think about how they structure the contracts. So here's another myth I want to bust. They say nuclear can, uh, I say nuclear can scale um, on mass production. They say, how can fast can nuclear be employed uh, compared to renewables? But if you look at it, the countries that have decarbonized, assuming, I know you and I don't really care about that issue, but assuming we care about it, Norway, Sweden, France, Finland, Canada, Belgium, Switzerland, all of these countries, Slovakia, built nuclear much faster than renewables ever could scale because they hit mass production, they just popped down the reactors. Um, they, Norway is the only exception here to the rule, Norway and uh, Canada, because they had hydro. But even today, I think Canada is mostly hydro and nuclear, much more than renewables at the moment. And so is it true of all Scandinavian countries. So even though nuclear is being denigrated, it is still performing better in countries that are very green. And I see an even green, greater Thunberg's country has recently gone over to uh, nuclear. So uh, nuclear definitely has a business case. So why do we hate nuclear? Well, the one thing the argument I put forth is nuclear doesn't have a constituency. Nuclear tended, historically at least speaking, to be government-to-government -government construction, not private construction. So it's like the military-industrial complex in a way. But the same point, um, there's radiophobia. I want to get into this. This is an excellent book by Dr. Wade Allison, who I've interviewed. You need to get him on your show. He's now in his 80s before the man passes away. And I said, we need to challenge what is called the linear no threshold model of radiation. I mentioned it last time I was in the show. I ended with this. And that is the assumption that ionizing radiation is a carcinogen. Okay. That's the assumption that all dosages of radiation is a carcinogen. It's complete nonsense. So let's quickly go to units of radiation. Radiation, there's two units they throw around, Bucharel and Sievert. In the US, you use RADS and gray, I think it is. You've got different units. So I don't can understand the imperial units. But generally speaking, Sievert is one joule per kilogram. That's assuming that's assuming I will absorb one gill in my body, basically, from radiation. Okay. Then you have Bucharel, it's the amount of nuclear decay uh, per second. It's the amount of neutrons that are shooting out, basically. Um, so if you have a concentrated mass, Bucharel is better. If you absorb it through a human body, you would lose, you see it. It's more of a broader term. But both of them get you to the same answer. It doesn't matter which unit you really use. Okay? It's just that the value will be different. So radiophobia. Okay, This is my favorite greenie in America. His name is Greg Schwartz, and I constantly fight with him on Twitter. And he's been winning awards for Fukushima, and he writes for Counterpunch. This is the most anti-nuclear uh, uh, website on the internet. And they make an argument here, small modular reactors remain unlikely, unnecessary, hail Mary pass, it's, it's dangerous, don't even think about nuclear reactors. Um, this guy tends to have a good heart. I've engaged with him a little bit, and he's, he's just scared. Okay, I don't think he's an evil person. He's just, he's just scared of nuclear radiation because he's been talking nonsense into his head for a very long time and he's made his career out of it. Now, what do you do with a guy like that? I don't know because I've been fighting with him and I just can't get something into his head. He's worse than the climate guys. Okay, But then you get people like this, Mr. Paul Dorfman. He stands behind him with a windmill. Okay, This guy's got, he's got a wind farm behind him. He's a World Economic Forum contributor and he works for the Nuclear Policy Research Fellow, the Nuclear Consultancy Group. I mean, there's more nuclear behind his name, his name than I've got qualifications. I work in the field. Okay. Now, look at this. This is an article that says Greenpeace and the collaborating organization called the Nuclear Consulting Group. Uh -huh. So the Nuclear Consulting Group sits on the World Economic Forum. They are linked to Greenpeace and they are Sunday selling wind farms. I mean, I don't know if you should be shocked that this is corruption. But this is corruption masquerading in broad daylight. Okay. And they are showing scientific literature to manipulate the reality of, and the bending of facts. They used to have a website where they said they were an independent group that is funded by Nuke, by Greenpeace. Believe that. They actually said it. Now they closed down their website because people were calling them out on that. Okay. These guys were responsible for almost destroying France's nuclear fleet. 
it advised President François Hollande a few years ago to commit to phasing out nuclear in France. They lobbied the French government. France fired the engineers, and that's why we had to rebuild at a high price, because we had to retrain engineers. They almost destroyed the industry through policy. And these people are dangerous. Okay, So Mr. Greg over here, he's got a good heart. He's a greenie. I don't uh, have an issue with him. I disagree with him. People like this are actively lobbying governments against the technology. I find that very sinister. Okay. Then this is a report that came out by French military intelligence a few weeks ago. And um, are they funded by German think tanks? So this is interference by German political foundation and sabotage of the French nuclear industry. And here they blame the Heinrich Ball and Loxa Ruxemburg foundations are directly involved in slowing down the development of nuclear power in France through anti-nuclear lobbying on French soil and destabilizing the uranium supply chain abroad. Okay, and they mention here the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the Koordinat Adenauer Stiftung, the Friedrich Neumann Stiftung, all these Stiftungs, German things. And you guys can look, this is the French, he called the Guerre Militaire, the School of Military uh, uh, Economic Warfare, Military Warfare. And France is now starting to see these anti-nuclear lobbyists as a threat to national security. South Africa is proposing to pass the law very soon to start looking into the funding of think tanks because they also involved in South Africa. India has already done a calculation and said think tanks that come from foreign money, and I must call it out, American money as well, sometimes through the CIA, is basically um, a threat to Indian national security. They did a calculation. They said it costs 3% of GDP per year. India has cut down all the funding of foreign money. New Zealand has banned Greenpeace as far as I know. Even they, New Zealand, a nice, nice country. So I think we need to start asking some tough questions about NGOs. Why are they advocating for policies that are destroying a technology. Okay, this is not on. I'm all for people saying there's a technical reason to dispute nuclear. I'm all for people saying that it might be less or more expensive than renewables and gas on a cost to cost basis, assuming with the right policy. But if you're going to impose a policy framework on a technology, you're being dishonest. Okay, that, that aims to destroy it. Policy should accommodate technology, should not destroy it. And then we can talk about competition. We'll see now what's happening in the US. So, more claims of radiophobia. This is Chernobyl. These are all the animals that are thriving at Chernobyl. Now, if radiation is so dangerous, why are the animals thriving? They're also mammals. Okay, you and I are mammals. So why are they multiplying? Clearly, humans were more dangerous than radiation. Now, this is the World Health Organization. I just Google this today. But they say 31 people died, and the UN said maybe 50 people died at Chernobyl. 50 people. Does that really justify the, the HBO documentary that scares the living daylights out of people? The animals clearly are fine. So clearly we overreacted at Chernobyl, okay? This is such a tiny number of people who died from radiation, assumingly. Fukushima accident. There have been no cases of the causes of death due to radiation sickness on a nuclear accident, but over 100,000 people were evacuated. They evacuated people, okay? When you evacuate populations, you cause population stress, and that kills them. Okay. Now, let's compare this to natural gas. Now, I must praise the natural gas. I've worked in LNG as well, so I'm not bashing an industry. They've got an enormously great track record on safety. But there was a major accident in 2004, and they learned from it. This was Algeria's uh, ski data, and it led to many safety standards adopted across the industry. So they learned from the safety, and they said, are we going to improve it and prevent these explosions from coming again? That killed 27 people. 72 were injured and seven reported missing. So it killed maybe three, maybe 20, maybe 30 people less than Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. And yet natural gas is still thriving. It's a highly competitive market. It's an enormously cool industry. They learned from their mistakes and they acted proportionately. Nuclear went into a panic. And that is where the main difference is. The nuclear industry can do a lot by learning from the natural gas industry, how to react to safety and how to respond to the actual risks and not disproportionately from the problem. So this is the tragedy of linear no threshold, the assumption that all radiation is dangerous. These are the amount of people who died during the evacuations of Fukushima yet nobody died from radiation. Evacuating people kills them, especially if they're old and fragile. Okay, Nobody died from radiation at Fukushima. This is the United States. Since you imposed strict radiation standards in the 1980s, the costs have, as you can see, exploded, the cost of construction reactors. Remember, the United States is three to four times more expensive than the rest of the world. Why? Because of the radiation safety standards that you've imposed onto yourself. It's not just radio LMT. There are other, radio, uh, other policies as well, like nuclear plants in the U.S. apparently are not allowed to load follow, even though they can't. There's a law preventing them from doing that. It's just ridiculous. So the regulations imposed on the nuclear industry makes it impossible for it to survive. And there needs to be a total revamp of the NRC in the U.S. I'm all for public safety. I'm all for containment. People should not misunderstand me. There's some 
clear radiation safety standards that are required. But if you're going to impose things that are just ridiculous, you're going to expose the cost. And I'm going to prove it to you later that it is so. So how did the current theory become adopted? And you've had, and I thank you for, for inviting him, Dr. Edward Calabrese, on your channel. 1950s, this Bay Committee came out with radiation fallout. The uh, committee got staffed by geneticists who were funded from the ominous sounding Rockefeller Foundation. And they made, based their committee recommendations on a few fruit flies. The modern day radiation standards are based on a few fruit flies and mice and not the actual data from the atomic bomb survivors. So we neglected human data. And if you look at the atomic bomb survivors, it tells you for a certain threshold, a certain level of radiation, it's actually beneficial. It's what we call radiation or mesis. It's like a sun tan. You go out in the sun, you tan, that tan protects you against more UV radiation. Well, that's a generalized rule for radiation for all exposures, even smoking, by the way. If you have a friend who smokes, just tell him to cut down. It's probably better for him than stopping smoking. Okay, But it doesn't matter. You see, this is the problem. So we have overreacted to the point where we want to eliminate all radiation. And they came and introduced a standard called ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. So they want to eliminate radiation to the point where you cannot measure it anymore, as opposed to saying as low as reasonably safe. What is the safety level? And that's all we accept. No, we want to eliminate everything. And that exploded the cost. That exploded the interest, the, the money. That's why nuclear plants in America have to bribe politicians to stay on, to, to, to survive. Because under the current regulatory environment, they clearly cannot. And that's why you have corruption and mafias in the industry. Okay. What were the regulation standards before we went off the, off the rails with the safety? Well, if you look at what they did during the atomic bomb in 1934, they had 100 milli, uh, milligrays, okay? That's the, the US units here, So the, uh, uh, which was okay per year. Today, it's 0 0.1. We increased our safety by a factor of 1,000 since the atomic bomb. And then we wonder, if we go back, why did this happen with the cost? I mean, it's absurd. So we need to just go back to the safety standards we had during the atomic bomb. If we, and we can probably keep the containment building because you know, it was maybe containment is an issue. That's all. If we go back to those standards, the cost will come down, in my view. It would be more proportionate. My estimate is the cost will be the same as the Chinese, because what the Chinese do in practice, in my view, tells me they already know this. So they're using these advantages. I recommend people read this article by Dr. Wade Allison. Nuclear energy is abundant and available 24-7. It's 13th of June 2023. It's the last month it was published. And he gave this to the House of Lords. And it goes through the whole story, what happened. Um, the modern safety standards are absurd. So we all know about Fukushima and Chernobyl, but nobody talks about Guyana and Brazil. That is the accident that nobody talks about. You know, did you know there was a nuclear safety accident in Brazil? Probably not. Why? Well, there was a pregnant woman. Okay, now, in medical science, pregnant woman is the ultimate test case, right? If you have a medication, if it harms a pregnant woman, that's off the market. Okay, And this was a pregnant woman who was uh, internally contaminated. She ingested radiation. She was pregnant. And then another woman got pregnant five years later. Both children were measurably radioactive and yet uh, uh, reported to be doing well. In the same way, the wildlife in Chernobyl is thriving because humans are gone and the radiation isn't harming them. Okay. Pregnant woman, woman who fell pregnant with radiation, ended up being fine afterwards. I think we can accept radiation is not dangerous if it passes that standard. I'm not a health physicist. I, again, I base my stuff on Dr. Wade Allison who spent his entire life studying this stuff. Radiation is not as dangerous as people thought, and that's the fear we need to get over. Okay, so the, the International Atomic Energy Agency states that the source contained 50.9 tera bucarel when it was taken, and that 44 tera bucarel of contamination had been recovered during the cleanup operation. This means at 17 remained the environment, it would have decayed to about 3.5. So there was a high level of concentrated radiation that was dangerous, but it decayed very quickly. And then some people even digested it, and they seem to be fine. And if you look at the decay for their body, it seems to be okay. That's much higher than Fukushima. Then there's other things. I don't really like getting necessarily into medical stuff, but I have to mention this. You know, there's this theory that radiation causes cancer, but it doesn't seem to add to the data, the gene mutation theory. Then um, also from the uh, um, cancer rate in Japan, for example, in males, it just seems that cancer scales of age, regardless of radiation or not. It's just something we get when we're older, Okay. Um, the ONT module assumes that mutations uh, mean an increase in cancer. So if you look at the amount of mutations, all the people have, uh, you know, you, you, you cannot see a pattern between the mutations and the amount of cancers, basically. So there's a decorrelation. That means the theory is bunk. Okay, so we need to challenge the gene mutation theory of cancer. And Dr. Edward Calabrese actually explained how the initial leukemia theory was also complete bunk. 
So this is big stuff that needs to be exposed. So questions you have to ask yourself, why isn't Ramstar Iran a toxic wasteland? Why isn't Chernobyl a toxic wasteland? Why isn't Fukushima? Why do the Germans go to hot spots that is radioactive and yet they want to shut down the nuclear power plants? And then there's data from across the world showing that air pollution in Tokyo, Seoul, Shanghai, air pollution kills far more people than Fukushima radiation will ever do. Okay. So what happened? We over panicked and we should never have evacuated many people. That is what is not being told. Um, excellent article I refer people to. This was written in the aftermath of Fukushima as it happened. He said we should stop running away from radiation. He called that your people worry about radiation because they cannot feel it. It goes on and on. And he says the um, emergency workers received a dose of 4,000 millisievert over a few hours and, uh, and they died. So 4,000 millisievert is a very high dosage. Those people died at Chernobyl. Okay? Those were the liquidators. But however, patients receiving a course of radiotherapy usually get a dose of 20,000 millisieverts to vital healthy tissue close to the treated tumor. This tissue survives only because the treatment is spread over many days, giving healthy signs time for repair or replacement. In this way, many patients enjoy further rewarding years of life, even after many vital organs have received the equivalent of above 20,000 uh, yearly dose at the above international recommended limit. So what radiotherapists are doing in terms of radiation is far worse, than, is, is much, much more intense than the standards of nuclear power, power plants. We need to relax our safety standards so they're in within proportion. That is the way to bring the cost down. Okay, We should not make nuclear more safe. It should be less safe. It is safe. You know. So what I propose and what others have proposed is that, uh, okay, well, just the first point here. If you assume that healing takes place, but if you have radiation exposure and you recover, okay, which is what most people do, it's like a burn. Um, clearly, linearity is wrong. Clearly, the organism recovers. It, it maintains metabolism. That is hormesis. And as we can see, up to 100 millisieverts or milligrays, um, you find that uh, um, there's a beneficial effect of radiation. It's probably good for you. And above that is a high dosage. That's where it starts hurting you. So we are saying relax the, the standards by a factor of 1,000. We'll probably save lives the process. And I make the argument behind all of this is there's this thing called the precautionary principle. You need to be so safe of anything. Must taste. Now, I can use a precautionary principle to, dis to destroy any technology I want to. Right? because nothing is ever going to be safe. And my view is a precautionary principle has absolutely no valid basis um, in science. It's a legal argument. Lawyers abuse it for the system. You need to amend your environmental and your public health laws to be risk-based, to be hermetic. And again, if you look at the atomic bomb survivors, this proved to me that 70,000 people, three generations, no genetic effects. We know a lot about the atomic bomb survivors right now. And there's people living in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They're obviously not being a mean, right? They, they are fine. So this is what we need to challenge, is this theory that radiation is so dangerous. So to put my money to my mouth, I uh, I believe in, uh, in testing what I believe in. I went to Iran, because my wife's Iranian this year, and I met Yastan Talishi. He's an 80-year-old man, or I think he's now 81, um, who lives in a background radiation of 250 millisieverts a year. Okay, This is about uh, 10 times the exposure at a, a nuclear, uh, sorry, nuclear power plant is 10 millisieverts a year, the safety. So this is 25 times a nuclear power plant. I ate the fruit that this guy that is grown in this environment. Okay, this is clementine. So you can see, I I can't look at it. I don't have a photo of me eating it. So you can maybe say I'm cheating, but I'm exposed to the background radiation. I'm standing next to the most radioactive guy. His house is the most radioactive place on earth. One of the most radioactive places. And he's alive in his 80s. And as you can see, I'm still alive with this guy. So I tasted the theory on myself, and I don't believe it's as dangerous, okay? That's probably the ultimate one. Then in terms of not expensive, this is the cost trajectory for uh, nuclear power plants for France and the UK. And that sort of tells you need to build about three plants to get the cost to come down again. The first one will be what Wachtel costs, more or less, and then you need two to three. So you need to commit for a long period of time. So if the US is serious about nuclear again, your taxpayers who have invested in it needs to know that it is going to cost some money, okay? Um, I'll show you now it's how much it costs. I did a quick calculation. It's it's some money, but it's not the end of the world's money. So another point I want to make here, this is just South Africa. We already have a waste repository. We put it in the Karoo Desert. It's one of the most isolated places in the world. Um, it's 100 kilometers square, and the water table is 100. Uh, it's one kilometer below ground, okay? It's a desert, no corrosion, and theoretically, it's infinite for South Africa's needs, the size of it. 100 square kilometers and our small economy is enough. 
Okay, that's why we don't have as strong uh, anti-nuclear people because they don't want to go to the desert to protest. It's very difficult to protest in the sun all day long. So we, we, we realize we put the spooks and the ghosts in the desert, even though radiation is not that dangerous. I've come to accept just build a facility and put it there. And if they want to protest in the Nevada desert, let them protest there. Okay, they, they'll quickly figure out it's, 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 it's too hot. There's actual climate change happening there. Okay. Um, just a, another story I wanted to add in here. So I'm going to sort of add a few other ideas. This is the uh, alternative for dry climate. So South Africa is the 25th driest uh, place in the world. It's sort of like many Western states, Texas, those areas we need water from far away. Even California, you know, they'll realize that they need water to pump there. The environmentalists don't like hearing that, but you, you cannot live in a desert without water. Um, and this was a project that the U.S. and America and South Africa actually co um, cooperated on. It was called the Pebble Bed um, React, and it was also shut down during the 2008 financial crisis and never really recovered. Now, X Energy in the U.S. is trying to build this in Texas again, and it's got benefits that it's a helium-cooled and not water-cooled reactor. So it's ideal for dry climates and can be used for industrial heat. This is Dr. Kelvin Kim. He's in his 70s. I still know the guy very well, and he wants to start this project again. They still have the patent. We technically have never closed down the project, but the engineers have been reduced. And, uh, you know, I pitch it to America to say it would be great if we can figure out from you guys again what you're doing, because X Energy is doing it, and to uh, cooperate. There's, there's always time for project cooperations again. Um, another sort of innovation in the industry. We are just, by the way, the Pebble Bed does not, it can run on thorium as well. Um, and uranium, you can replace these balls with every one of them. So there's a potential for more applications. Um, another innovation that's happening is floating nuclear. Russia is quite big on this. And they first started on a steel boat, and now they're going to probably start on concrete, with pre-stressed concrete. I've actually done the design for the pre-stressed concrete here. So you build on water, and then you build it all in a harbor, and your supply chain is, is centralized. So from a construction point of view, you can just tow it to its location. And the advantage here, there's no earthquakes, there's no tsunamis. Because what happens with an earthquake and water just floats on top. It's an army just floats on top of the water. So if you build nuclear on a boat, you reduce your cost by just eliminating these potential issues. Um, yeah, then just again on the pebble bed reactor, um, it was established in 1994, and it was one of the largest reactor design teams in the world at that time. It was a U.S.-South African cooperation. And it closed down in 2008. And I, I just say to American audience, it'd be nice if we can revive something like this, because the Chinese... I finished the first commercial commercial pebble bed in the world. They're ahead of us. And we need to try and get that back. And the advantage of, of gas cooled reactors is they've got more heat. So you can use it for industrial applications, for example. You can use it for um, uh, for decarbonizing cement and steel, or just making cement and steel cheaper. I mean, rather put it that way to your audience. So there are potential applications for advanced reactors. And there's, there's other reactors. This is an interesting one to the economics of waste. Okay. Um, I pitched this to the first United States state that can do it. And they were the first private investor, because you guys don't like government spending. You're allergic to it. Okay, So the first uh, uh, the first shady capitalist or forward-looking businessman in Texas, whoever you're sitting at the US, they don't tell you is that waste, because it has a half-life decay, it has a negative interest rate. So what does that mean? It's a gold mine. If you store it, you get paid money for it. So I did a quick calculation. This is a 2% interest rate. If I stand with, a, say, $100,000, it's theoretical, the stuff, and I compare a negative interest rate to a positive one. So let's say I put the, you pay me 100000 to store the waste. Tom. You've got your you're a nuclear power operator, and you're giving me the waste, and I'm in Nevada, for example. And I say, okay, I'm going to invest that money in the market, a 2% return. And let's assume the waste decays at 2%. It means just by sitting on my butt, I made $82,000. Okay, so the first state in America that builds a nuclear waste treating facility and gets paid to store the waste will be the richest state in the United States. Okay, I'm pitching this idea to a shady investor, whoever. So please, uh, if you're listening here, uh, whoever state you is, this is how you kickstart nuclear again. Build your waste facility so you have money for the industry because all the states, will, 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 all those green states that are scared of radiation will pay you and you can use that money, put it in the market and live on the interest. For example, because all you have to do with waste if LNT is wrong. Because remember, LNT is, uh, assumes it's zero interest. But let's assume we know it's wrong and it's a threshold. It means it's going to decay to a threshold. What does that mean? The waste burns itself out. There's no treatment necessary. There's nothing to do. There's no business case for waste. All you have to do is build a, a facility and put it in a hole and wait. And that's it. So there is no there is no waste problem, so to say. So just another innovation is the fuel cycle. 
France is into this at the moment where they're mixing a bit of plutonium uh, with their waste to try and get efficiencies up. You can also do it with thorium. Thorium is not fissile on its own. It needs to be kickstarted with uranium, and I suspect you can probably use plutonium as well. And anyway, this is more innovations. You can increase the efficiencies of the reactor by just replacing the fuel. It's quite a cool trick. And private investors can actually get into this. So I'm saying maybe government, government needs to build these big reactors, but the private guys can look into the fuel and optimizing that. Um, there's also another perception nuclear cannot load follow, but the Germans were actually doing it quite efficiently before they shut down their power plants. But there's a US regulation that prohibits your power stations from load following. So your spot market in the US is killing your nuclear power plant. Your regulation is killing your plants. And I suspect the gas industry was actually lobbying for that. Right. So if your nuclear power plants are allowed to go into load following mode, they can survive. It's one regulation that is basically destroying it. Okay. Then there is a sign of overregulation. This is my view. This is why I just say the US. Usually in any market, when there's black markets, when there's mafias, it's a sign of overregulation, right? So for example, when alcohol was illegal in America in the beginning of the last century, people didn't stop drinking. They were just shooting each other in the streets of New York and they started mafias like Lucky Luciano and Al Capone in Chicago and these guys. There's a nuclear mafia in the United States. That's interesting. And the nuclear mafia, they are connected with trafficking nuclear waste. So think of this. If waste was so expensive, why is the mafia figuring out how to do it? Okay. This, this can't obviously be dangerous. Okay. So there's clearly a market problem area. Regulation is creating a black market. And interesting enough, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has links to the nuclear mafia. That's why he's facing prison sentences at the moment. They were smuggling uh, uranium into Israel. And that's why Israel has nuclear weapons, although we're not allowed to say it. So anyway, there's, there, there is an international trade in waste. It's just done by the mafia. I'm just saying there's, there's a nuclear mafia, and maybe people need to look into that. So this is another thing which is called the full cost of electricity. These are generally for nationalized grids. This is the Nuclear Energy Agency. And they're making a point that in the developing world, particularly, that to integrate wind and solar and all these things, you still need transmission lines. You still need peaking gas plants. You still need to count the number of batteries and all these things. And if you look at the full cost of electricity, you'll find gas, coal, and nuclear in terms of cost. But my view is if you cut out the regulation, nuclear might even be more affordable than coal and maybe even compete against gas. So clearly for the developing world, nuclear is a more attractive option because we have fully nationalized grids. And we don't have to adapt our grid before we integrate renewables. We can just, or before we integrate uh, nuclear, but for renewables, you have to adapt it. Okay. This is LCOE, levelized cost of electricity. I don't really like this metric, but I know people always throw it out, so I have to mention it. And this assumes you know how much money the plant is going to make throughout its lifetime. And you take the cost divided by the money, basically, and you get the metric. And essentially, if you keep nuclear plants running, it's very affordable in the US even. So plants that have paid their debt back are some of the cheapest to run. New plants tend to have an issue. So it's a good thing to upgrade your plants and to keep them going in the US. But make sure your regulation accommodates that. Maybe specify a certain percentage of base load. I don't know how you're going to do it. But your regulation has to change. Otherwise, you can destroy your existing plants. All right. Most affordable electricity in South Africa is nuclear as per the balance sheet. I always look at the balance sheet. That's how engineers are trained. I don't believe in any models and predictions. I look at what is in the business. And in South Africa, it's just the most affordable according to the balance sheet. But remember, we built it under a nationalized utility years ago. And I think that is the big debate. How much of a new deal can does America allow for? So this is again the same graph. As you can see, uh, renewables do not new renewables do not compete with new nuclear in South Africa because we still have to integrate them. Okay. Um, here's a few suggestions for the US sort of that I've been reading into this. First of all, finish your waste repositories. I argue the US needs about three of them. Okay. You need to build three nuclear plants. Uh, my suggestion is use all the tech. Keep a design that worked in the 60s or 70s. And just rebuild it, okay? But maybe keep the containment structure because you don't want Chernobyl with the things flying all over the place. Um, I said a project will recover will uh, require government support. So I think nuclear advocates need to be honest that the government will have to bail us out because the industry is at risk of dying. I would say policy reform uh, might be required, and LNT is an obvious no-brainer. But there are other ridiculous safety rules. Aircraft crashes seriously. What do you really need a 9-11 into a nuclear power plant? Is your Air Force incapable of shooting down another terrorist? Um, basic public health regulations like hormetic principles. Base your public health on risk space. Get rid of precautionary principles. And I said build traditional plans before advanced reactors. Sticks with what works. And then you use that as a springboard for advanced reactors. I know the, the DOE is looking at advanced reactors as well. So maybe you've got a money for all of that. 
and another one which is more unpopular for America, I would argue that signing the non-proliferation treaty or moving towards non-proliferation is generally a good thing. Nuclear weapons are highly expensive and useless. I mean, the US, there's 12,000 of them in the world. You, we know we're never going to use them. We'll keep five or six or 10 or something, the most advanced ones. But do you really need that many? You can Because there was a stage when the US and Russia was trading stuff, I think. And for about 10 years, 10% of electricity in America was reprocessed, reprocessed warheads. So that's a very good application for nuclear. I, I don't like nuclear weapons. I think they, they don't do much. And I don't think they work as deterrents either. Um, eliminate risks. That thing that Russians are doing by building on water. If you build like that, I think it'll be good. Um, I argue the cost to get going again. This is the three repositories for three plants, about $220 billion. That's a lot of money. But that's two years of the war in Ukraine. The money that Joe Biden just blew on the war in Ukraine, if you use that for nuclear, you would probably get your cost and production down. And understand, you need three plants. And you need the government to commit to it. You can't have greenies blocking it with legislation again. So legislation that they abuse must be eliminated. Um, then they suggest another myth I want to dispel on nuclear. This is relevant to construction, but it's Iran. Um, I did this interesting interview with Gareth Porter, and he wrote this amazing book that is called uh, The Manufactured Crisis, The Untold Story of Iran's Nuclear Scare. And this is Netanyahu here with his stage one, two, three bomb with the at the UN, which is just ridiculous. And this is a quote I want to read, but they say, nuclear weapons neither ensure security nor do they consolidate political power, but rather they are a threat to both security and political power. Uh, the events that took place in the 1990s showed that possessions of such power, weapons could not even safeguard a regime like the Soviet Union. And today we see certain countries which are exposed to waves of deadly insecurity despite possessing atomic bombs. This is Ayatollah Saeed al Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran, who issued a fatwa, a religious fatwa against nuclear weapons. Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. It was manufactured by Mossad. And Gareth Porter explores the entire story. And I want to add here on Iran. Iran is building nuclear power stations from their own technology at the moment, okay? Um, this is uh, Faresti Sadiq. I met her when I was in Tehran. And um, they opened up eight new uranium mines. They're going to build five new nuclear power plants in five provinces. And I would say a road to peace between America and Iran can lie in nuclear cooperation. So I want to end here with the final quote. And that is Dr. Wade Allison, where he said, um, you know, to appreciate and engage the benefits of nuclear energy, human society should overcome the fear of it in the same way as we did when we accepted fire a million years ago. Then by leaping, leapfrogging um, the animal instincts, humans became the dominant life form on Earth. Today, we acknowledge the drawbacks of carbon combustion, its tendency to propagate without control, the effects of pollution um, that it spreads, and even its destabilizing effects on the climate. In place of fire, f uh, um, physical science offers nuclear energy. Education for our children should explain how this energy is a million times greater than the chemical energy of fire and that it is comparably safer too. They should be encouraged to study the scientific evidence in, in medicine, in laboratory experiments, and in accidents. And then with our help, they should build their future on nuclear technology for the economy, for security and peace. This will take a generation or two for those nations that grab the opportunity early and spread the benefits worldwide and have the advantage. So I'd like to thank you. And I would say this is the biggest reason why there's opposition against nuclear plants. One or two or three reactors in Dubai, okay, both with a relative delay. I think it was two years delayed due to COVID. Seven years has done more to add power to their grid than Portugal and Denmark did in almost 20 years. So few reactors and you've solved the carbon problem if you, that's even a problem. And I think that's what all of this is about. There's enormous inertia against the industry because all these guys know that we're out of business if nuclear is more affordable. And yeah, thank you, Tom. The, the electricity is only 10% of all energy, right? Um, and everyone seems to go for the electricity market, which is so saturated at the moment in the States. And the natural gas is just eating everyone's lunch, let's face it. Um, why don't we focus nuclear maybe on boats and on um, you know industrial heat? And we try and, and, and use it for those type of energy first before we try and compete with the 10%. You know, it's like everyone's going for the same little margin that is not even there. Because even natural gas, guys, it's so... Let's look at the other day. There's 40 countries in natural gas at the moment. It's so competitive geopolitically, and nobody can, can price hawk. So you, you want to really go into a market like that? Maybe go for something else, which is industrial heat. And I think X Energy, that Templebay company in Texas, have the right one because they signed an agreement with a chemicals company. 
And I think maybe that pressure, uh, the pebble bed and, and the, those type of advanced reactors might be a solution. I'm still in favor of constructing traditional ones to maintain your expertise, even if it requires government bailout. But I, you, you just have to admit it's going to require government money to save the industry. Because in, in the US, you really have a problem with, with not constructing on time anymore, given all these regulatory stuff, right? All right. There, there's a guy named David Ruzik that does some highly popular videos about what really happened at Chernobyl and Fukushima. Have you seen those at all? Or? Mm -mm. No, I haven't seen them. Okay. Um, but I, 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 I've spoken to Wade Ellison on this, and he's probably the, um, he's probably one of the best sources on this thing. Yeah, I'm going to try to get him on here uh, right away if I can. Uh, one other unrelated thing is, uh, what do you think about the hazard or uh, potential hazard from radiation from like my Wi-Fi router sitting right by me here? Is that is there no? It's just bogus. I no mean, problem. your your yeah. your your Wi-Fi and the stuff is not even ionizing; it can't break molecules. And you need, I think, a double helix break or something. So it's just complete nonsense. I mean, the, the concentration is so low. And, and the thing is, even if it, it does damage, your body heals. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like putting your hand on a stove. Yeah, it's going to burn you and that's it. Good. Good to know. Any other uh, points you'd like to make before we wrap up here? Well, I, I would say there is a geopolitical aspect of this as well, which people need to take into account that, you know, uh, Russia and China and uh, South Korea are now building. Now, you can argue South Korea is maybe a U.S. ally. But it's it's not very comfortable for me as somebody that's we, we need energy in the developing world that the US is not like getting its act together in building nuclear power stations. So I, I would like to have them there in Africa, but I can't accept the deal under those costs at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And there's geopolitics involved. So maybe that's a way to encourage the Republicans to say, look, and the Russians are beating you, and <laughs> maybe <laughs> for the Democrats. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. All right, uh, if there's not anything else, we'll go ahead and wrap up. But thank you. That was a very good presentation. I enjoyed that. Oh, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Hugo Kruger. Bye-bye.